bon dia, meus parentes. Muy bueno, bonjour, nino, y maganado. I'm here today to speak to you mostly about uh, some work that's been going on at uh, Shingwak in the Magyogamek. Um, it is a uh, Anishinaabe uh, run and focused and uh, controlled post-secondary institution in uh, Northern Ontario in Canada, based in the site of a former residential school. Um, and uh, before I go on to uh, tell you about that, I want to continue to introduce myself um, by uh, by explaining, uh, or by, by sorry, by saying, Nigananabe uh, Indishnakas Atekundodem Ogijigashkagundonjba. Now the reason that I do that I'll, will become a bit more clear later, but it's because it's a practice um, that we begin actually every single class at Shingwak with not only instructors and teaching assistants, but also all of our students, because it's a practice that's essential to Anishinaabe ontology. Um, before continuing, of course, I should explain that you know, Anishinaabe people are uh, one of the largest indigenous civilizations in Canada and the United States as well. Um, and uh, the, the function of Shingwa Kinamagi um, has been to uh, reclaim those, uh, that aspect of Anishinaabe ontology and epistemology that was lost through the residential school process. Um, I won't go into too much detail uh, as I had previously uh, anticipated in terms of the background and the methodology so that I can have a bit more time to discuss the uh, um, sort of the meat of uh, what it is that I want to, to, sh to share with you, which is how in an Anishinaabe-centric classroom where our own uh, epistemology is, is the, the cornerstone of the education process, um, how we also create an environment that's inclusive of people of all racial backgrounds within that uh, philosophical framework. So, one thing that I do want to emphasize though is that uh, at Shingwak we uh, do offer a three-year uh, Bachelor of Arts degree in the Anishinaabe language as well as uh, there are six credit elective courses in Anishinaabe studies, um, the focus of which are uh, in terms of are focused largely on leadership development uh, of our students, um, which is actually quite a, uh, a multicultural uh, uh, a mix of, of students. About two thirds Anishinaabe and one third uh, a mix of uh, settlers from your uh, of European background, international students, settlers of uh, non-European background, um, and. Uh, the focus of, of my discussion here is actually on these uh, six classes. So the, the, the important thing to, to bear in mind in terms of the centering of Anishinaabe ontology and, and, uh, and, and worldview um, in the work that gets done at Shingwak is also to consider the role of Shingwak within that framework itself. Um, the, <coughs> Uh, curriculum and, and the pedagogy that we've developed is, is firmly rooted in um, uh, two sort of large uh, aspects or pieces of that uh, um, that framework. Uh, one is the Atsukan, which is the uh, sacred oral stories uh, that share um, aspects about uh, creation stories, about uh, the nature of our relationship with the earth, uh, with, uh, with one another. Um, as well as prophecies that have been relayed to Anishinaabe people in, uh, at different stages in, uh, in, in history. Um, and uh, one of those uh, prophecies is, uh, uh, one of those Atsukan is uh, foundational for the work that gets done at Shingwak, and that's the Seven Fires Prophecy. Um, this, uh, this prophecy was relayed to Anishinaabe people about three generations prior to Europeans arriving in North America. And uh, at the time when the uh, uh, Anishinaabe people were located actually on the eastern shore of North America, so around Maine, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, um, they uh, were visited by seven prophets that each told uh, the, uh, the story of, uh, of a different fire that would come into, uh, that would be confronted, that they would confront, sorry. Um, and uh, each of these fires represented an era that was to come in Anishinaabe people's history. And for brevity's sake, I'm going to, as much as I would like to go into each and every one, um, I'm going to jump to the fourth fire, which uh, spoke of the coming of the light-skinned race. Uh, this, uh, uh, during this period, uh, Anishinaabe people were warned that 
uh, to beware that the light-skinned race could uh, come either bearing the face of brotherhood and sisterhood, or alternately it could come bearing the face of death. Uh, and should it come bearing the face of death, as much as those two faces would look similar, it would be hard to tell the difference, um, we would be able to tell the difference when the, uh, uh, the rivers ran with poison and the fish became unfit to eat. From that point on of contact, uh, the, there would be a period of struggle for, uh, for Anishinaabe people. Um, and uh, at that time, there would be a false promise made. Uh, we now, looking back on, on history, can, can see that this is the promise that, uh, that missionaries brought to uh, North America, the, the promise of salvation through Christianity. Um, and that in accepting that, process, uh, that, that false promise, uh, that led to the sixth uh, time of even greater suffering that we can see with the implementation of the Indian Act, with the residential schoolings that took Anishinaabe people from their, uh, from their parents and uh, restricted the use of their language, to degraded the, uh, um, their life ways. Now the children from, uh, from that generation that turned away from, or that accepted the false promise, in the seventh fire, um, there would uh, develop, uh, a number of them would become what's called the, uh, in the prophecy, the Oshkabe the, the new people, who uh, would go along that trail um, of their elders and pick up those pieces of, of their history, of their practices that had been left uh, uh, by, by their elders. And at that point, we would have uh, the choice between two roads. So in, in the sense uh, of, uh, of that prophecy, the work of Xinhua is not just uh, a manifestation of those people that are um, on that road, picking up those things that have been left along the trail, but also creating space for others that are along that journey, um, creating access to the traditional stories, to the traditional knowledge, um, to help them in, uh, in getting to that, uh, the end of that seventh fire. Um, one of the uh, other sort of focus, uh, uh, or what I, I suppose one of the um, uh, things that we emphasize in, in, in our, our program as well is that uh, uh, when we were born, we all come into the uh, we all come into the world with four uh, unique gifts from the Creator, and uh, those gifts are our name. Um, you know, you might hear it uh, referred to as a spirit name, or uh, typically we just say Anishinaabe name, um, that's conferred through ceremony. And this actually tells us something about, um, the, uh, about our potential in life. Also our clan, um, which is conferred patrilineally, um, and uh, tells us something about our role in society, as well as our language and our free will. Um, recovering these gifts uh, is a central part of the curriculum at Xinguac because each of these gifts at some point has been um, systematically uh, taken away or suppressed in the colonization process. Uh, through the enforcement of Christianized names, through residential schooling that, uh, that uh, uh, initiated a serious process of language shift, um, and through an entire regulatory matrix that attempted to uh, limit the, the, the free mobility and free will of uh, Anishinaabe people. Now, a lot of Indigenous and Native Studies programs uh, across uh, Canada and, and presumably uh, the rest of the Americas can, um, uh, will focus on reclaiming uh, history that has uh, been omitted from mainstream uh, schooling. Um, but uh, in etching what we also try to con conceptualize that recovery as part of a healing process, looking back at sort of the traditional healer's adage that in order to heal one must know the wound, um, we can, set, we can look at confronting the legacy of colonialism as um, re developing a reconnection with our history, our families, and our languages, but also in connecting with these gifts, we also emphasize that um, revisiting this history is about reconnecting with our fundamental identities as well. In terms of uh, Language. I mean, the, the language program at uh, at Chinguac has actually been uh, offered previously um, by uh, Algoma University, which is an institutional partner for probably about a decade before Chinguac ever existed. Um, but uh, it still is now actually a, a, 
very significant cornerstone in, uh, in the work that gets done at Shingwon. Um, it Language in our curriculum is conceived of as uh, representing not just the um, uh, a method of communication that was provided by uh, by the creator, but in fact, a uh, also a reflection of that worldview. To go back on one of Ian's earlier comments today, the the content of the language versus the form um, is really uh, the sort of meat of, of of what we want to emphasize and uh, um, the significance that it has for uh, the continuation of uh, Nishnabe people. And so Sue, uh, she's a, a self-identified native student within her uh, mid-50s. She's in the second year of the language program. She, reflecting on the use of, um, and how it's conceptualized, uh, or how language is conceptualized in the program, she says it really nicely complements what I've been taught at home about our language. Our language is living. There's lessons, life lessons, right in the language itself. Um, similarly, the Anishinaabe Studies programs and the emphasis they place on language can be a catalyst for uh, students to actually start learning the language altogether. Uh, Alan, who's actually a non-native student in his mid-30s, uh, in the first year class, um, spoke uh, about the significance that language had in terms of revitalizing uh, or, keeping a or keeping a culture alive. And so, in learning the, attempting to learn the language at least, um, he felt he was doing his part uh, in that work of the Seventh Fire. Now in terms of reclaiming name and clan, um, you might think, well that's fine and dandy for Anishinaabe people, but how are non-native people supposed to identify their spirit name or figure out their clan lineage? Um, <coughs> nonetheless, we actually require that of every single one of our students. Um, and the reason for that is rooted in the of, uh, uh from which we uh, we take most of our knowledge. Um, the, uh, the naming it can be complicated because uh, typically what will happen is students will, will go with the name that was given to them by, uh, or at least non-native students will go with the name that was given to them by their parents. Um, though some may do extra research in um, the uh, traditional naming practices of their, their ancestors. Um, though uh, when it comes to clan, uh, things are a bit more complex. Uh, from uh, the, uh, the story of the Earth's original people, uh, we, we know that uh, from, from uh, the framework in which we, we work, um, that all the Earth's people at some point had uh, a form of clan governance or traditional governance uh, conferred to them by the Creator that uh, pro allowed them to exist in equilibrium with the Earth. Um, now, this story basically is uh, set with uh, Wendem uh, the uh, Earth's uh, original man and his wife, uh, the firekeeper's daughter. They had four sons, and at, once they uh, became old enough, they each set off in each of the four directions. Once they re uh, settled there and married the, uh, the daughters of the doorkeepers in those directions, um, that was the genesis of the Earth's original four races. Um, and at that time, in that story, we're told that while there were not many people in each of these corners, that there were all those things that were uh, that made life uh, livable in uh, balance with with the environment. Based on that, and the teachings that we see in the stories about clan, sorry clan governance, uh, we know that those teachings are what enabled our uh, original people to uh, exist in that equilibrium. So while many of the students, you know, we, we don't actually necessarily expect all of them to go to their uh, family genealogy and come back and say like, oh yeah, we've got our plans, it's awesome. Um, it's actually a very long process and um, for <coughs> Uh, for our Anishinaabe students, if they don't know their clans, uh, if nobody in their family knows their clans, then it does require spiritual intervention. Um, for those that come from uh, lineages, say, across the Atlantic or the Pacific, there may not be an obvious tradition on which to fall back on. Um, however, the research that goes into looking into their lineage always provides unique uh, and like, incredible results. Um, we had a, a student from Nigeria who, when he asked his grandmother uh, about 
clan, the clan system in Nigeria, she began to cry because nobody had ever asked her about that. And she was the head woman of her clan. Her children didn't know that. Her grandchildren didn't know that. Um, and that knowledge would have died with her had he not bothered to ask. Um, similarly, actually, a number of our uh, students that come into the class identifying as non-native uh, uncover uh, indigenous lineage. And so that can be seen in, in the case of uh, Allison here, who uh, first identified as, as a non-native settler ally. Um, and when she had to do the research of finding out her clan, she discovered um, actually her uh, grandfather was Algonquin from Quebec. Um, and when students make this discovery, it's actually a shocking number of them that do. Um, the, they're placed in a, in, a, in a sort of uncomfortable position of having to navigate racial dynamics that are different within a Anishinaabe worldview versus those that are dominant in Western academia or uh, even in uh, critical race theory. Um, and I know that there are a multiplicity of conceptions of race in, in our uh, uh, Western academic traditions, even within crit critical race theory itself. So what I have here is not so much a, a representation of, uh, or not an attempt to represent the uh, uh, breadth of, of, of that theory, so much as a reflection of student experience in, in butting up against those, uh, those epistemological differences. Um, so coming out of the, uh, the classroom, you know, the, uh, they're confronted with the uh, conception of race that sees it as uh, socially constructed, as being based on experiences uh, of racial oppression, uh, or sorry, of racism, and uh, consequentially, their ability to pass as white people gets either read as privilege, purely, um, or alternately, actually gets uh, uh, dismissed entirely as you know this uh, as, as inauthentic uh, because for having not lived a true uh, experience of uh, of a native person, whereas in uh, Anishinaabe uh, 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 conceptions of race, alternately. Um, these are based on blood memory. And so our connection with our ancestors, all of our ancestors, no matter how many different lineages we have, are complete. They are not divisible, they are not dilutable. Um, and consequentially, that blood memory gives us unconditional membership and acceptance within a given racial category, as many racial categories for which we have lineage. Um, the, the other thing to, to bear in mind, though, is that, that the, while it determine, blood determines membership, it does not determine path. Um, there are practices for adopting the uh, um, uh, people into Anishinaabe clans and, and, and families that are more based on uh, presentation uh, or, or the sort of performativity of uh, Native identity. Um, going into the idea of free will, um, this is where that, uh, those introductions come in because what we want to do is to emphasize for our students the, um, the give them the tools they have to exert that free will um, uh, with confidence, e even in the matrix of uh, all of the regulatory conditions that uh, that limit um, that have limited Anishinaabe uh, uh, subjectivity and and, uh, um, and likewise over the, the past generations. In terms of the challenges and opportunities that I wanted to focus on, um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a lot uh, that we can touch on. One is the uh, um, pan-indigenous uh, uh, solidarity that can be generated across the Americas through, the, uh, uh, through some of these teachings. Um, though some of the challenges that we have are also rooted in the, uh, um, the acceptance of Anishinaabe epistemology on its own terms and not trying to make sense of it within the lens of Anglo-European Western philosophical tradition. But ultimately, and this is where I'd like to conclude, um, our biggest challenge is also our biggest opportunity, and that's in recognizing that we are in the time of the seventh fire, that we have a choice uh, between whether we go down the road of, uh, of destruction, of continuing environmental degradation, or um, whether we make the right choice in uh, trying to correct the disequilibrium that has uh, occurred in, in, um, our, in our world. 
in doing so, in taking that right road, we can go back to that fourth fire and re-envision the face of brotherhood and sisterhood in which we are told uh, the two original, uh, the two races that came here, or the, the race, the two races that met here in the 1400s, 1500s, um, that uh, they would be joined by two other nations, and that those four nations would make uh, together a, um, a mighty nation that would light the eighth and final fire. So, miigwech, that's all I have. Mm -hmm.